Good morning, I'm Bob Pritchard, uh, usually in the pews at 8 o'clock, uh, and glad to have a chance to join in this celebration today. I wanted to share three notes so you'll be warned about today's service. And the first is, we're using a tricky form of the prayers of the people. Uh, and if you notice in your bulletin, we are both on page 838 and 392. What we're doing this Sunday after the 4th of July is we're including prayers of thanksgiving for the nation, and then we're moving to the prayers uh, of familiar form, which enables us to play, pray for our special needs, for those who have died, and to offer thanks for the blessings of this life. So we go from... Um, the nation and then we're going to have to it's going to require the ability to turn from one page to another so uh, second thought is that we are going to use eucharistic prayer c and that has more speaking lines for the congregation than the other three forms so it would be a good idea when we get to that point and i will announce it there in the service uh, that you should go to eucharistic prayer c otherwise you won't know which lines the congregation has and finally, um, I erred, and uh, it's not the case that the uh, communion hymn and the recessional hymn are the same one, uh, even though they have the same numbers in the bulletin. So when you get to the final hymn, the hymn board is right. It is 539. We're not singing 577 <coughs> twice in a row, uh, and I apologize for that error. So our opening hymn, our procession, is going to be Kim 518.
Holy Eucharist Rite 2 begins on page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be you, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Lord God Almighty, in whose name the founders of this country won liberty for themselves and for us, and lit the torch of freedom for nations then unborn, grant we and all the people of this land may have grace to maintain our liberties in righteousness and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated for the lesson? A reading from the second book of Samuel. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bones and flesh. For some time, while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in. The Lord said to you, It is you who shall be shepherd of my people, Israel, you who shall be ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed, king, they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. David built the city all around from Milo inward, and David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. 
if you'll read with me Psalm 48 responsibly. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. In the, in the city, city of our God, God is in his holy hill. Beautiful and lofty, the joy of all the earth is the hill of Zion. The very, very center, center of, the of the world and the city, city of the, of the great, great king. king. God is in her citadels. He is known to be her sure refuge. Behold, the king of the earth assembles. They march forward together. They looked and were astonished. They retreated and fled in terror. Trembling seized them there. They revived like a woman in childbirth, like ships of the sea when the earth shatters them. As we have heard, so have we seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts is the city of our God. God, God has established her forever. We have waited in silence on your loving kindness, O God. In the, in the midst, midst of your temple. Your praise, like your name, O Lord, reaches to the world's end. Your, your right hand is full of justice. Let Mount Zion be glad and the cities of Judah rejoice. Because of your judgments. Make this circuit of Zion. Walk around about her. Count, Count the number of her, of her towers. towers. Consider well her bulwarks. Examine her strongholds. That, that you, you may tell those who come, come after. after. This, is, this God is our God forever and ever. He, he shall, shall be our God forever and ever. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But I, on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me, given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath they began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that, he, that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? They took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. And Paul said, I know one who is taken up to third heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Conversion, turning in a new direction, lies at the heart of the Christian faith. All churches of different varieties acknowledge it, though in slightly different ways. In the Episcopal Church, our most realistic conversion language is found in the baptismal service. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And in the lessons that we hear on Sunday mornings. Conversion is, I think, particularly important in American Christianity because we were populated initially during the great evangelical revivals of Europe and many European immigrants brought with them a deep sense of personal faith. It's so much a part of our life that even our political commentaries pick up conversion language. It is hard to get through a presidential election year without hearing someone say, uh, this candidate needs a go-to-Jesus moment or a Damascus Road experience. Damascus Road because the conversion of St. Paul on the road to Damascus is a kind of biblical poster for what conversion could be and might be, and it is an example that have been followed and studied by Christians in the two millennia since.
And most of us know the broad outline of that story. Paul, originally called Saul, was an opponent of the church and was present at the execution of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He went to Damascus with letters of authority from the high priest in order to arrest Christians who were in Damascus. But on the road, he saw a bright light. He was struck blind for three days and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And within three days, he had met with the Christians in Damascus and been begun a major reorientation of his life. He was one who went from being the biggest enemy of the gospel to the most zealous preacher of the gospel in the Greek-speaking world of the Roman Empire. A conversion that changed a man and changed the spread of Christianity. Now, the interesting thing about that conversion story is it does not come from Paul. You never hear in Paul's writing of what happened on the road to Damascus or of seeing a bright light or of those words, Paul, Paul, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Rather, that is Luke's retelling of his experience, which you find twice in the book of Acts. In chapter 9, we have the story of Paul's conversion, and then in chapter 26, Paul appears before King Agrippa and explains his faith, telling again that story of his conversion. Paul only once tells of the story, and he tells it in the second letter he writes to the church at Corinth, And it is the epistle that we had heard this morning. Now, if you didn't notice it was Paul's conversion, you are pardoned because he never mentions the fact. He said, I know a guy who had a conversion. Let me tell you about it. It's his own story. And then he tells the story and he doesn't mention Damascus. He doesn't mention Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He doesn't say anything about blindness. He tells a story with more subtlety and I think with more confusion, perhaps, than the nice job that Luke does. Luke is a historian, and like historians everywhere, he tries to take complicated stories and put them out in a plain language that people can follow. But Paul has a more nuanced and a more difficult to follow story. I knew of a person who was taken up to third heaven. If you're not confused then, um, I'm not sure why, because there is no reference to third heaven in the Old or New Testament outside of this passage. It is a curious construction which is taken probably from Babylonian astronomy and does show up in some of the apocalyptic literature that comes out of Israel in the first and second century before Christ, but it doesn't show up in the Bible anywhere. The the story is this one. Babylonian astronomers looking at the skies notice that most stars in the night related in a kind of lockstep fashion. They did the same thing. They did rotate, but they stayed in relationship to each other. But they were seven bodies which wandered around apparently wherever they wanted, the sun, the moon, and the five planets they knew about outside of the Earth, that is Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And so some smart Babylonian astronomer came up with a theory. Maybe the Earth is covered in a series of globes or bowls and each one of those seven objects is on one of those levels and they turn in different directions because they're on different domes and so one dome carries the sun and one has the moon and so on there are seven of them and then some theologians in babylon and elsewhere including among israel 
began to speculate that God Almighty or the pagan gods in whom the Babylonians believed inhabited the seventh heaven, and there are all these nice intermediate levels that were responsible for the sun and the moon and for these planets that wandered around in the heavens. Now, I think what Paul is doing here is he's trying to clarify something he said in his first letter to Corinth. In the 15th chapter of that letter, he repeats what undoubtedly is a list of people who saw the risen Lord on Easter Day that has been, and thereafter, that has been circulated among Christians in Jerusalem and the surrounding area. And he takes his own name and tags it to the end of that list. So the Lord appeared to, first of all, to Peter, and then to James, and then to all the disciples, and then to a larger number, and last of all, as one untimely born to me. For I am the least of the apostles, because I persecuted the church of God. So his claim is that in the same way that others saw the risen Lord right after Easter, he saw the risen Lord. But he wasn't a Christian then, and his appearance on the road to Damascus comes somewhat later. And I don't know, we don't have a letter of the Corinthians to Paul, but apparently he adjusts what he said earlier and offers a kind of solution. When the Lord appeared to this person that he knows, who is Paul, he didn't appear on earth as was the case with Peter and James and the other apostles. He appeared to them halfway. That is, Christ in the highest heaven came down to third heaven and Paul went up to third heaven and they met there. And that is how he met the risen Lord. And then he says, of course, whatever it was that Christ told me, told this other person who is abundantly clear is Paul, whatever Christ said, that can't be spoken again. Uh, that's too sacred, that is too important, and so I won't tell you what it is. Now, Luke has an idea of what it might have been, but Paul doesn't tell us. And then he follows this by jumping to a topic that comes up occasionally in his letters, and that is his affliction. Just in case, he says, I got too excited about being taken up to third heaven, and, and by the way, I don't know whether it was in body or out of body, whether this was a spiritual experience or a physical one, God knows that, I don't know. Uh, and that third heaven might be paradise, I don't know, God knows that. Uh, but I was taken up uh, into heaven some way or another. And after it he says, so that I would not be so proud and elated and overjoyed about what happened to me, God put a thorn in my side, a reminder that I not be too proud of what had happened. He doesn't say what that thorn is. There's no explanation of it. The, the two guesses I hear most often is the thorn may be epilepsy or the thorn may be blindness because in Luke's story, Paul is struck blind for a time and in Paul's letters, he complains from time to time that he has to have someone else write for him or that when he does write, he has to use extra big letters uh, so that people can see them and he can see them. But he has some kind of affliction. So Paul's story isn't quite as sharp in detail and line as the one we hear in Acts. He did have an experience. It changed him. He saw in some way the risen Lord, whether in the body or out of the body. And he began to preach the gospel, but 
he had an affliction that kept him from being too elated about what happened. A number of years ago, I was uh, teaching a night community class at Virginia Seminary on the history of Christianity uh, in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. And um, one group that came to the class was kind of interesting. It was a group of about eight or nine people who always sat together, who arrived in two cars or a van and a car that parked next to each other. Uh, and if they ever had a question, one person asked it and everybody was immediately alert in that group. Um, near the end of the series, they asked to speak to me. And so I waited after and they shared a concern they had. They said, we're good evangelical people. We're a part of an evangelical church, but we're worried because we have not had conversion experiences that are like the one that Paul had. And they wanted so deeply to have the Pauline experience in which they had a clear voice from God and a clear vision from God and were absolutely certain of what happened. Now, I didn't think of it at the time. We had a long conversation about conversion and what Jonathan Edwards said about conversion and I tried to be helpful to them. Um, but I think one of the things I could have said was, you know that conversion that you want to have with the absolute clarity of the Damascus Road experience of Paul? Paul didn't have that experience either. He, Luke tells us he did, but Paul used much more nuanced language. He's not exactly sure of all the details. He's heard something, but he doesn't think he can tell you exactly what those words were to him. In any case, he thinks that's something private. In the past year, I had a similar conversation with someone else who said, you know, I think everybody else hears the word of God, but I don't, and hears it with a clarity. Uh, didn't mention Paul in that conversation, but indeed, again, it is one that harkens back to Luke's clear picture of Paul and conversion. That's a great model, but it's not even clear that's an exact description of what happened to Paul himself. God touches our hearts and our minds and calls us to be converted, to turn in a new direction toward faith and belief, but does it in lots of different ways and not always with the absolute clarity that some attribute to Paul but which Paul himself does not actually claim when he writes about it to the Corinthians. And I think there's a message of comfort as well for us when you look at his wrestling with his thorn in his side. When we wrestle with things that we would like God to correct, when we hope for release from illness or maybe just from the neighbor next door who isn't as nice as we would like that neighbor to be or whatever it is that is a complaint in which we find ourselves, we shouldn't be surprised if that does not always go away. Or as some would say, I asked God but God said no uh, to my request because again here, a great leader of the church, a person who gave his life to the spread of the gospel, a person who died as a martyr, prayed to God three times, and his suffering was not taken away. So we have a lesson about conversion today and an encouragement to us to seek conversion, but not to expect God to deliver it in one form and perhaps not quite as vivid as the beautiful experience that Luke describes, but which Paul himself does not claim. I know a man who was taken up to third heaven. Amen.
the Nicene Creed on page 358. We believe in one God, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified and defiled. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Begin on page 838. <clears throat> Almighty God, giver of all good things, we thank you for the natural majesty and beauty of this land. They restore us, though we often destroy them. Heal, Heal us. us. We thank you for the great resources of this nation, they make us rich, though we often exploit them. Forgive, Forgive us. us. We thank you for the men and women who have made this country strong. They are models for us, though we often fall short of them. Inspire, Inspire us. us. We thank you for the torch of liberty which has been lit in this land. It has drawn people from every nation though we have often hidden from its light. Enlighten us. We thank you for the faith we have inherited in all its rich variety. It sustains our life, though we have been faithless again and again. Renew us. Help us, O Lord, to finish the good work here begun. Strengthen our efforts to blot out ignorance and prejudice and to abolish poverty and crime and hasten the day when all our people with many voices in one united chorus will glorify your holy name. Amen. Amen. Then the prayers continue on page 392. We pray for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. You may add your own petition silently or aloud. <clears throat> Hear us, Lord, for your, for mercy, your mercy is great. great. We thank you, Lord, for all the <laughs> blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and, and praise, praise your, name your name forever and ever. ever. We pray for all who have died that they have a, may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Let your loving kindness be upon them who put, put their, their trust, trust in, in you. you. On page 360, the Confession and Absolution.
Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? The peace of the Lord be always with you. Are there announcements to be made for the coming week? I have one announcement uh, from Libby. The hymn we're singing during Offertory 719 uh, is not just reserved for the choir. We're allowed to make noise too. So uh, hymn 719 and reminding you again, 539 will be the final hymn uh, and it's incorrect in the bulletin. Um, yes, Scott. They, thank you. There will be coffee hour in the parish hall following this service. Uh, I would also ask that you would keep um, Beg Moncure in your prayers this coming week. She's having a medical procedure, uh, and she's asked for our prayers, uh, and that's that she would be here uh, otherwise, I think. Um, she um, is... Uh, great and faithful in her uh, service in this parish. Uh, and, and continue to keep um, Stuart in your prayers of thanksgiving for his service. This is his first week of retirement as, uh, <laughs> as rector. And then he starts as a supply priest the next week, <laughs> assisting in another parish. Um, other announcements? Um, I will tell you, I'll be here next week, uh, and then the following two weeks, uh, Alicia Wheeler will be here, the retired uh, former rector of Kingston Parish in Matthews, uh, who often is in the back corner of this service, um, and, and she, I, uh, she will be with us um, for the last two weeks uh, in this month. 
Ascribe unto the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts. gets the lines in italics, and I get the Roman text. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. By your will, you were created, and I From the primal element, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only Son born of a woman to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood, you reconciled us. By his wounds, you revealed. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, 
and with those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim this with them your glory in their unending Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving. Celebrate his death and Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hands at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share the body of Christ. The gifts of God for the people of God.
body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The 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 body of Christ.
body of Christ. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of all my God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.
let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks to God.